Hello, everyone. Welcome to the October presentation of the Wayne Historical Society. Today, we'll be talking about the Wayne County Poorhouse and Asylum, commonly known as Eloise. Be presented by myself, Tyler Mall. As early as 1805, Michigan Territory had laws in place for the relief of the poor, but largely this job was left up to individual counties to take care of. Now, the first county house built in Wayne County is this building seen here, built in 1832 at the corner of Gratiot and Mount Elliott Avenue. This area was largely farmland at the time. By 1834, though, the building was nearly uninhabitable. There was really not a great system in place for taking care of the building or the people inside, and conditions deteriorated rapidly. A Roman Catholic priest, Martin Kundig, was appointed the first superintendent and he helped improve conditions. But plans were already being made in 1839 to move the county house to a larger, more centralized location that really could have more space to grow and expand. This is a map of Wayne County. Detroit is seen here in this box right along the Detroit River. And the new site for the new county house was chosen in Nankin Township. That's seen in this box right here. More centralized location that had wide open and relatively cheap land. This is Nankin Township a little bit closer up. The site chosen for the new county poor farm would be this land right here. The large diagonal line you see running across the screen is the Michigan Central Railroad. Following right along parallel with that is Michigan Avenue, then known as the Chicago Road. And the snaking black line you see also going through there is the Rouge River. So as you can see, the site chosen had great railroad, road, and river access. It's also close to the early village of Wayne, right here. The land up north would eventually become the city of Westland. This land over here would become the city of Garden City, and over here the city of Inkster. Now, the land that they bought in 1839 belonged to the Torbert family. They bought the land from Samuel and Nancy Torbert for $800. It included 160 acres of land and this building, the Black Horse Tavern, which they had run for a few years. It was built in 1828, and it was a stagecoach stop along the Chicago Road where travelers could stop, rest overnight, get a meal, and continue with their journeys. It was a simple log cabin. Uh, actually two connected by a small breezeway had mud chimneys and very primitive conditions now before the county actually sent anyone out here they bought an additional 120 acres they also built a two-story wooden building behind the log cabin to house the inmates and the log cabin was then used as the keeper's house in 18, april of 1839 the first 35 persons were transferred there from the detroit poorhouse 111 people refused to go out to the awful wilderness. In 1843, the old log cabin was sold for $2 and moved to a new site. A new brick building was built on the original site of the cabin in 1845. This new building had a basement with two cells uh, for the drunk and unruly, and also had chains fastened to the basement walls for the unruly and the crazy. The brick building was enlarged in 1856 and in 1858, and the original wooden building that sat behind it was taken down. And in 1865, a keeper's residence was built out front for the person to live there and supervise. This is a great image of what the county house looked like all the way up until the mid 1860s. This was taken in the 1880s, but it shows those original buildings with the original keeper's house. Now, at the time, up until 1868, there was no distinction between the rational and the insane at the county house. Inmates were divided by sex, but old people, orphans, babies, the blind, the idiotic, rational, poor, and insane were all kept together in this building. And there also was not a doctor on site. There was usually just a keeper, his wife, and two or three attendants to take care of the poor, the crazy, and who knows all what was there. And chains were used when necessary.
Now by 1867, the number of insane persons at the county house was increasing. It was making life unbearable for the others that lived there. Now in 1868, this building, which was the first asylum, opened. And it was the first building dedicated strictly to the care and housing of mental patients. In this photo, taken in the 1880s, shows that same asylum building with wings that were added on in the 1870s. Now, for at the time, mental patients were not really understood or properly cared for. It was kind of a throw them in here and forget about them kind of thing. They would be chained to the walls, put in dark cells, and just basically forgotten about for the rest of their lives. In this view, we can see all of the entire county house circa about 1880. On the left, we see the asylum buildings, which cared for the mental patient. In the middle, we see silos in a barn that was part of the poor farm. And on the right, we see the county house and the keeper's house, which cared for the poor and the elderly. And then out front, you can see uh, livestock paddocks and fields. From 1839 to 1881, all doctors at what was the county house, were not permanent. They only came once or twice a week, and they were usually visiting doctors from Detroit or from Wayne. In 1881, the supervisors made the first requirement that the keeper must have a medical degree. Before that, the keepers of the county house were just regular farmers. They were people that lived in the area that were looking to get some political status, and they would become the keeper for a few years help care for them, and then usually move on to a bigger career in politics. Many of the first keepers became state legislators. Now, Dr. Bennett was one of the first to actually have a medical degree. He removed the shackles and chains and removed the inmates from dark cells in the basements. He was the first to kind of help understand and try to help cure the mental patients. He did all of the medical and surgical work on site and this is really the early days of trying to actually treat and cure patients instead of just locking them up and forgetting about them. And he had a lot of success. He actually cured quite a few patients and the practice of trying to cure mentally ill patients caught on. In 1887, a new administration building was built called A Building between the asylum and the county house. And that's where in the previous pictures, we saw some barns. Now this building housed offices, a fire department, storerooms, post office, a few male insane wards, and a chapel. This is that chapel from the 1887 administration building, or A building. And this was used by patients and by the poor that were living at the county house. Here we see some of the auxiliary buildings in the 1890s. The building on the left was the gas plant, and that's where they actually manufactured their own gas for lighting. They originally, in 1886, put in 500 gas light fixtures across the buildings. Now they decided that that wasn't really a great source of light. It was also probably pretty dangerous to have open flames around mental patients. So in 1894, they built the middle building, which was the electric light plant, and they wired the whole place for electricity. And it was actually the, only the second private electric plant in Wayne County. And it was so advanced for the time that uh, professors from U of M came out to study it. And the building on the right was the steam power plant. And that was built in 1887. Now before then, the, both of the buildings were powered or uh, heated by 59 wood stoves. And the inmates would have to chop the wood themselves light and stoke the fires. For example, in 1880, the county bought 80 acres of woods, which when chopped up only lasted them three years. So they were going through wood at an accelerated rate. And in 1887, they decided they should probably put in steam heat and radiators, and also decided that having wood stoves around mental patients probably wasn't a good idea either. Here are a few other auxiliary buildings. The building on the left was the carpenter shop. In the basement, it housed the first and original morgue for the county house. The buildings in the middle were part of the sewage system, and the building on the right was the old schoolhouse. 
from 1839 until 1887, the county house actually had children living at it that were largely orphans of accidents or pandemic and disease outbreaks in Detroit. Now the state did mandate that they had to be educated. So when they could, attendants and clerks would try to educate the children as best they could. There was originally a small log cabin out by the river that they used. And when it burned down, the county built this building to act as a schoolhouse. And it would have a full-time teacher there to educate the orphans that live there. In 1887 though, they decided that it really wasn't the best place for them to live. And many of them were adopted out to local families to be taken care of. Now, another interesting note of an auxiliary building is that from 1832 until the mid 1850s, uh, the county house was actually mixed race. There were both white and African-Americans living there. And there was really no problem with that. But in 1858, the county supervisors actually built a separate building for the African-Americans here at the county house. And during the Civil War time, there were about 69 either freed or escaped uh, African-Americans that lived there. And this actually remained segregated until 1880 when the building was torn down. And after that, the county house was integrated again. Other buildings of note, I'll include laundry buildings built in 1895 and their first bakery built in 1905. In 1899 and in 1905, the old asylum building, this building seen here, was heavily renovated to become the building you'll see next. This is what became of that building. It's still the original buildings from 1868 but they added another floor, added some turrets and towers, and generally made the building a lot larger. This building would actually survive until 1955. If you look closely, you'll see the round planter with the arch over it that still exists on the property today. Another uh, interesting note is the large lake that's out front. That lake is also still there between Michigan Avenue and the railroad tracks if you drive by. It's largely grown up with trees now, but that lake was created to help solve a major problem at the county house, is how to get water. So in the beginning, they had wells, but the wells kept running dry. They found a natural spring on the southern side of the property, but it just couldn't keep up with the growing demand of all the people that live there. And the water in the area was also very hard. There was a lot of minerals in it. It didn't taste or smell very good, and it required a lot of treatment. So finally, they just built this giant lake out front dug a very deep well and pumped water into it, and that lake still survives today. In the winter, they would also harvest ice from it and store it all year long. So remember, this is the days before refrigeration. Here we are in the 1890s, and up until this point, the location is always called the Wayne County House. And here's when the common name of Eloise comes about. In 1894, the property was trying to get a post office. Before then, all the mail was just sent to Wayne and they would have to go and pick it up. The Board of Supervisors submitted several names to the post office, but they were all rejected. So without his knowledge, the board submitted the name Eloise, who is the four-year-old daughter of the board president, Freeman B. Dickerson, to the post office. And the name was accepted because it wasn't used anywhere else in the US. So on July 20th, 1894, a post office was opened with the name Eloise. The railroad station that was at the site also adopted the name Eloise, and eventually the name just became synonymous with the site and the board accepted it as an official name. It was the official name up until 1945 when it became Wayne County General Hospital and Infirmary at Eloise. The real Eloise Dickerson died in 1982 at the age of 93. And this is her picture with her beloved St. Bernard. This is a quick shot of the Eloise Fire Department about 1910. This was at the back of A building. And you can see they had a really cool host cart and quite a few men on staff. In 1893, this building, C building, was built as a women's ward for the asylum side. 
Now back over at the poorhouse side, these old brick buildings in the keeper's house were torn down in 1894 to build a new building. This is what was built. This massive building would house all of the poor and the elderly and the infirm that were not in the mental side of the institution. In 1903, tents were erected outside the building to house inmates with tuberculosis, as it was on the rise at the time. In 1909, it was added onto with some wooden shacks, and this became a sanatorium. It was believed at the time that open air treatments were the best way to cure tuberculosis, to cure the lungs, was to breathe lots of cold and fresh air. So the treatment was often done out in the open, no matter the season. Um, incoming patients, however, were often poor and in the advanced stages of the disease, and many were basically sent there to die. And these tuberculosis sanitarium section ran until 1923. Eloise also had a pest house, which was an isolation building for people with smallpox. It said that it was only used two or three times in about 30 years though, because smallpox wasn't too bad of an issue around here. Eloise was also pioneering in the use of x-rays. Chief bookkeeper Stanislas Keenan had learned about advances in um, how x-rays worked in Europe, and he loaned some electrical equipment to the hospital and set up an early x-ray machine. He built and enlarged this prototype, and it was ready in 1896. It became one of the first, if not the first, facilities to use x-rays to render a medical diagnosis. People were sent from all over, largely from Detroit, to check for fractures and broken bones, something that had never really been possible before. And many of the original tubes and equipment are still in existence and are in storage in Detroit. Eloise was also pioneering in the use of radium and radioactive isotopes to treat skin cancer and tumors as early as 1910. There was talk of creating a specific cancer hospital here, but it never came to be. Here's what one of the early x-ray labs looked like back in 1913. A large component of the county house was the farm. When the county purchased the land back in 1839, it came with four cows, two oxen, and some seeds. The idea was that the poor would work the farm, making themselves useful, and also providing supplies for the running of the place. And it was also thought that farm work was therapeutic for mental patients, so it was win-win. Uh, this is one of the barns that was built in 1886, but the place would house cows, horses, pigs, oxen, and they would grow tons and tons of fruits and vegetables, most of it to be used on site by the people living there. Here's one of the greenhouses that was part of the farm. These were used to start plants early in the spring and also to grow trees, flowers, and bushes for the grounds, as they also decided that having lush uh, grounds and paths to walk was also good for mental health. Here is the grain and horse barn, which was built in 1896. And out front, you see the Holstein cattle herd. This was a prize-winning herd that was very, very much talked about at the time. The farm also had root cellars, a piggery, henneries, a blacksmith shop, greenhouses, farm manager cottages, a tobacco barn, and a cannery to can the fruits and vegetables that were grown on site. And the tobacco barn was used to dry tobacco, which was grown on site and eventually used and smoked on site by the inmates. The farm could produce 65 tons of food per month. Uh, but after World War II, the farm started to lose money pretty badly and largely closed by 1955. From then on, the institution would have to buy its own food. While it was open, the poor persons living in the poorhouse side would often work four to six hours a day tending to the farm or perhaps doing some maintenance work around the buildings, acting as painters, cleaners, etc. Going into the 1920s, there was a huge increase in the number of patients that needed served at the county house at Eloise. The population of Wayne had doubled and the population of Dearborn quadrupled during this time. 
This brought an increased number of poor persons needing help at the poor side and a large number of mental patients needing to be served on the mental health side. These five buildings, buildings I, J, K, L, and M, were all constructed between 1921 and 1929 just to house mental patients. They were at the corner of Michigan and Merriman, and you'll see in the next picture. So this is the corner of Michigan Avenue and Merriman. Michigan Avenue is at the bottom corner of the screen, heading up to the right, and Merriman running across to the left. And you can see all these buildings around a central courtyard, those were all buildings specifically to house mental patients. The 1920s also brought advancing treatments for mental health. Uh, this was the time of early pharmaceuticals. There were finally drugs available that could help people. There were insulin shock was developed, hypnosis, and electric shock. In 1924, they also built a brand new power plant. This building is still one of the few that exists now. You can see it from the road in its advanced deteriorated state. Throughout the 1920s, the population at Eloise was growing at 20% per year. When the stock market crashed in 1929, the poorhouse population skyrocketed. A consequence of this is the large building at the bottom left of the screen that was called N Building. It was 382,000 square feet, which is over 10 acres under one roof and could house over 2,000 people. There were so many people living here that they built a 200 gallon coffee urn and piped coffee to the counters in the cafeteria. By 1933, there were 7,441 persons living in the poorhouse and another 2,600 in the mental wards. This is what a typical ward would look like in end building. It was just largely a bed and a chair. And during this time, about 3,000 inmates worked in the farm, the kitchens, the dining rooms, shops, and maintenance, if they were able-bodied enough to do it. With the opening of end building in the 1930s, the previous poorhouse building, the large building seen on the screen here, was empty. And plans were made to turn this into a general hospital. So in 1931, the building was renovated, an extra floor was added, they changed a lot of rooms around, and they built surgical rooms, operating theaters, and generally made this into a large, fully functional hospital, something that had never really been at this site before. And it was going to be open to the public and act as a county catch all for emergency services. The hospital here became a teaching and internship hospital for students from Michigan State, Wayne State, and for drug companies to come and test new medications. Here are some of the hospital staff and nurses seen in the 1950s. In 1931, the old administration building, A building, was torn down. This building, known as D building, was put up and became the administration building. The first couple floors were offices and the top couple floors were mental wards. Today, this is known as the K Beard building and is largely the only surviving building left of most of these. From 1938 to 1940, a new assembly hall was built by the WPA using depression funds. It seated about 700, and it was a large theater with fly space, dressing rooms, and three stages. And it was used for meetings, church services, and shows for patients and for doctors. It was later known as Gruber Auditorium. Interestingly, the Wayne Westland Civic Theater tried to save it. They were a local uh, amateur theater group in the 1970s, but by the early 80s, the building was ultimately closed due to code violations and the cost of upgrading it, and it was unfortunately torn down. Back in the day, there really was no privacy or HIPAA. As you can see in this newspaper article, 
Uh, they would publish your name, that you were committed to the insane asylum. They would put your diagnosis and really just put your business out there for everyone to see. In this article, also published in the newspaper, it talks about a young girl, only 12 years old, who was declared idiotic and uncontrollable, and she was ordered by a judge to be committed to the Wayne County Insane Asylum. There were also lots of allegations of abuse at Eloise. In this article, they're investigating the death of a patient who died 24 hours after being admitted. The hospital tries to say that it was a stomach ailment but mysterious bruises on his body could mean otherwise. In a place like Eloise, where there was a lot of people and not necessarily out of oversight sometimes, there's no doubt that there was varying degrees of abuse there. They also had people escape from Eloise or escape on their way. Uh, this article in the newspaper talks about a man that's wanted and you see his description there. In this article, we see a son who killed his mother. Uh, they lived near Wayne. Uh, they found her nearly lifeless body, and she unfortunately died at Eloise Hospital. And they found her son, the murderer, in the woods and also took him back to Eloise. There were also suicides. Uh, the article on the left, a man jumped over a third floor stair banister and fell to his death. The one on the right, person jumped out of a third floor window. This is a great overhead shot of Eloise. Running parallel through the middle is Michigan Avenue. We see the railroad tracks, some farm buildings on the left, and the large complex of buildings on the right that house the mental wards and the poorhouse. Now, through the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, overcrowding became a major problem. They were as much as 50% overcrowded. One of the main problems was that the state was refusing to take more patients to its hospitals. In the 1890s, the state had said, if a mental patient stayed at Eloise for one year, then they would be transferred to a state hospital to free up the bed. But the state conveniently never had enough bed openings to take people, and they began to pile up at Eloise. The state also wasn't reimbursing Eloise for the full cost of housing these patients. They would only pay maybe about 80 or 90% of the cost with the county having to eat the rest. In 1946, the cost to house a mental patient for the day was $3.15 and the state was not covering most of that. There was also a rise in mental patients to over 4,000. Capacity at Eloise at the time was only 2,500. Into the 1950s, the older asylum building seen here, which was from the 1860s originally, was closed due to being a fire trap, further reducing bed space. In 1962, a new general hospital building was built. It was used as a teaching hospital for U of M and Wayne State students. In 1955, the farm finally shut down. All the animals were sold and the barns and machinery was left to decay as it was no longer financially viable. Here we see another aerial from the back of Eloise with N building down at the bottom and Michigan Avenue up near the top. In the 1960s, Eloise faced increasing criticism. Costs had risen to $10.05 per day to house a mental patient and the state was still not fully reimbursing. In 1966, Medicare came out and forced a whole bunch of new requirements on the hospital and the mental health side of the building. Now to get reimbursed from the government, the mental wards had to become private and not part of the county and not state. All the state mental patients were transferred out and new attitudes encouraged home care and private care homes and Finally, the overcrowding had kind of subsided. They also closed several of the old buildings and tore them down and eliminated 360 staff. To comply with new Medicare rules, a new building was built to house 
uh, mental patients. In 1974, this new long-term care facility opened, uh, but in 1976, the entire facility at Eloise only had 228 hospital beds. In 1977, the state cut off all funding to the Wayne County House. In 1979, on December 1st, the psychiatric hospital was closed after 147 years. The new building, which had been built in 1974, was sold to the state to be used as a psychiatric hospital. After 1979, all of the patients were gone and most of the old buildings were torn down. Eventually, even the 1960s General Hospital was closed and torn down. A few bits of Eloise still remain though. Seen here is the flower planter that was out front of the original asylum building. Also, the 1974 long-term care building is still being used today. D building, the K Beard building, is still there, though in a state of decay, and it is used occasionally for tours at Halloween time. The power plant still is there, largely decaying. The fire station is there, though the walls are starting to collapse and the burned out ruins of the bakery are still on site. The lake that they used to draw water from between Michigan Avenue and the railroad tracks is still there behind the trees. And here and there you might see remnants of farm buildings. The land, however, is mostly privately owned now and it is patrolled by the police. So I would not advise trying to go exploring in any of the buildings. Here at the Wayne Museum, we do have an Eloise exhibit um, showcasing some original artifacts and telling the history of Eloise uh, from beginning to end, how it got its name. Uh, we even have a radiator and some grills on the walls that were in some of the asylum buildings. And on the right, you see a bowl and a mug and a spoon that we have that'll be on display soon. The Westland Historical Muse Village also has an Eloise Museum on their property. It encompasses an entire house and uses a lot of artifacts that were saved by the county when the buildings were torn down. And that's available to see um, during their designated hours. Thank you for joining me for this presentation about Eloise in the Wayne County House. Eloise has a very long and interesting history and I definitely can't get through all of it in a presentation, but hopefully this inspired you to Think about a few things, maybe learn a few things you didn't know, and so maybe go on and do your own research about the history of this very interesting place. Thank you again.